Hello, everyone. Welcome to a brand new episode of the James T Podcast, where we spin the jams and spill the tea. And finally, we are coming at you today with a series of reviews for new albums, our first official coverage of 2023 releases. Uh, Finally, at the end of January, we got something worth talking about. Today, we are going to be discussing a joint pair of records, one of which being the new album from Lil Yachty. Let's start here. And of course, after we talk about that, we're going to talk about the new album from Paranol after the magic so riley why don't you set up up a little bit and talk about uh mr boat for yeah. a second here so even before i get into that right so obviously this is our only our second set of new release reviews this year and the first set were both albums released in december of last year so we've mm-hmm. been waiting and this is normal right january is a slow month i said it and i think in last week's episode that january is always a really great month for album announcements but a terrible month for album releases because mm-hmm. artists don't want to get a a, you know, don't want to jump in too quickly and risk their album being forgotten by the time that list season comes around at the end of the year. And, um, but, you know, within the particular spheres of online music discourse and discussion and stuff that we occupy, namely rate your music, there is something very advantageous about releasing an album early in the year, which is that because of the way the rate your music chart system works, there's just fewer albums earlier in the year because more albums are released as the year goes on so if an album is released in january it is more likely you know by definition to chart on the chart and by definition as a result of that reach a wider audience and it's not as though artists like paranormal and lil yachty were you know in need of a wider audience they were kind of getting that anyway but these two albums are currently at the number one and number two spot on the rate music album of the year chart And so both within the online community and outside of it, considering that these are records that have made considerable waves in, you know, across different music communities that you might not expect them to be successful in, it's a really great time for both of these artists. You know, Paranul Mm -hmm. got Best New Music from Pitchfork um, for After the Magic, which is kind of crazy considering, you know, the the source of this band and the fact that they're not really the kind of thing that Pitchfork goes in for Mm -mm. or or has really gone in for in a a really long time. So that was amazing and awesome to see and will absolutely increase the profile of this artist. And Lil Yachty as well being this punching bag. And okay, so let's get into it with Lil Yachty, right? So Lil Yachty, been around the block for a while, one of the, you know, huge wave of pop trap rappers that have emerged in the late 2000s one of the less successful ones although certainly he's had Mm -hmm. a number of canny features that have put him have given him a decent amount of profile and he's managed to at least create conversations with mixtapes like Lil Boat um certainly I think prior to this that was the release that he was most known for that most people had heard it's fair to say that his albums that came out after the Lil Boat mixtape landed pretty inauspiciously uh Mm -hmm. one could say with a thud even with Lil Boat I mean Lil Boat was a mixtape that a lot of people heard that generated a lot of attention but it wasn't exactly something people were hyping up Uh, it was kind of something that people were were laughing at and were cringing over because it was this really surface level really kind of almost parodic um pop trap music it was something I think that people who weren't necessarily super into that already kind of found very easy to kind of point at as this kind of joke sort of thing or this person who's low hanging fruit low hanging fruit exactly and Lil Yachty I suppose didn't help his case in the public estimation with records like Teenage Emotions and Nothing to Prove which you know again landed with a thud as well and even though he had features from artists like Playboy Cardi and Juice World and member different members of Migos and stuff artists that he's clearly coming up around and coming from a similar toolkit as he never really had that level of success. And it felt as though you were watching someone who was trying to claw their way into that space of respectability and acclaim, but could never really do it. And one of the things that I think is kind of sad about that um, is that Lil Yachty has always struck me anyway, as someone who's not this, you know, necessarily this, canny cynical career climber who's Mm -hmm. trend chasing for the sake of being successful he strikes me as someone who is just a very passionate artist who believes a lot in the music that they make and does it very much for the love of it 
In fact, in a lot of respects, he reminds me of Kid Cudi as a personality. Another yeah. artist who very much embodies that whole mindset of, I am just going to chase what feels real to me. And a lot of it is this incredibly earnest and kind of cringy. I was going to say, very, I am cringe, but I am free. Yeah, exactly. And they're both coming from that same sort of mindset. And there's absolutely something admirable about that. And I feel as though as the 2010s have gone on and into the 2020s, there's kind of been this cultural wave of slowly building acceptance and embrace of artists like this. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't always land well with us as well. I think this is kind of like the, you know, the, even before this album, which is a whole different kettle of fish, but the gradual turnaround on artists like Kid Cudi, the gradual sort of embrace of their, you know, cringy freedom even though they make really bizarre aesthetic decisions, they're really bad at writing from a technical standpoint. They There's this kind of like vulgar auteurism almost with these artists yeah. and younger people particularly. They appeal to them. And, you know, with someone like Playboy Cardi, who I think is a really great example, that's mm -hmm. almost something that I've almost been able to get on board with because I can kind of see the vision there a little bit more. And there's this primal aspect to his music where it's just kind of all about just purely losing yourself in these very simplistic but loud um, elements. And I so I see a lot of that with various artists. And Lil Yachty, I think, has kind of been trending in the direction of people kind of coming around on him through that lens of someone who just unabashedly is themselves. But mm -hmm. there's one of two things you kind of have to do, I think, to start earning that. And what, one pathway is to start writing re in a really kind of emo fashion and just being really, really hard on sleeve and pivoting into a direction where you're leaning into your cringe in a way that Lil Yachty, I think, hasn't quite done yet. And the other part, the Kid Cudi approach. Yeah. And the other pathway is finding a new musical approach that gives you a new audience, essentially, that can kind of give you an in with music critics or with audiences in general that will then convince your detractors that they over that they underestimated or overlooked you and that's kind of what Lil Yachty has done with let's start here it is both a canny and savvy move from a marketing and commercial standpoint into music that is going to get him more critical respect that is going to get him more critical acclaim because it comes from a place where the aesthetics and the genre conventions that he's pulling from are stuff that is more fashionable is more critically respected is more generally enjoyed you know, reference points like Tame and Parlor, for instance, have been a dime a dozen with this new music, which is to say it is this pivot into psychedelic rock, but specifically this very modern, polished psychedelic rock that is so embedded within the framework of pop music. And the thing about this pivot for Lil Yachty is it doesn't feel cynical to me. It doesn't feel like something that he's adopting in a very sort of half-hearted way to kind of try and squeeze some respect off of other artists. It feels like something he is fully committing to. But at the same time, it is a savvy move. It is something mm -hmm. that completely, I think, has shifted the narrative on Lil Yachty 180 degrees. And approaching this record, especially depending on where you're coming at from Lil Yachty. I've never really spent much time with any of his music. I've been aware of him. I've heard a few songs. I get the general gist. It really can't be overstated what a dramatic pivot this is for Lil Yachty. Like this is, mm -hmm. this is not just, you know, him making music that feels like it's complete in a way that his music hasn't been before, but it is sonically just night and day, a complete different, you just a complete sheer 180 away from anything he has done before a complete reinvention to the point where it's almost difficult to even conceive of it as the same artist and to his credit Lil Yachty has gone about constructing this putting this together recruiting collaborators and executing a vision that feels very labored over that feels very thoughtfully considered and that has a very keen eye for album construction this is a record that I enjoyed very much the first time I heard it, even though it was clearly wearing the skin of, you know, 
Tame Impala through a Pink Floyd lens. I mean, like the first track, for instance, the Black Seminole is kind of like, it's like every 70s Pink Floyd album rolled up yep. into one. Like you have yeah, Wish You Were Here elements. You have When the Female Vocals Come in the back half of the song. It's so yep. like great, great, great gig, gig in the, in the sky. sky. Sort of thing there's yeah. like so many different things he's kind of slamming together but it is done with such dedication it is done with such complete wholehearted adoration of the reference points that he's pulling from like he clearly loves this music he's clearly making this because he wants to be able to be a part of the scene that that music that the music of pink floyd kick-started that has rippled through pop and popular rock music ever since and what i love the most about it is that it is both a fully committed psychedelic rock record in that sense, but it is also something that finds ways of tethering that to some of the aesthetics that Lil Yachty is more familiar for. Like you get certain elements of trap and popular hip hop music and uh, sort of soul influenced uh, and even, you know, it's psychedelic influence in uh, hip hop and trap music is not necessarily a very new thing, but, Yachty finds a way to both be himself and to both bring forward some elements of who he is as a personality and of, you know, the culture that he comes from and make this feel as though it is a natural next step for that. And it's, it's really impressive. It's really remarkable. It's something that certainly has growing pains and you probably will be more ready to speak to those than even I will. But I've gone throughout the week that this has been out, I've gone from appreciating the idea of this to actually genuinely enjoying the execution of it. I think there's a few songs that where it does sort of, it, it wears its aesthetic thin a little bit, but for the most part, I'm really into this. I particularly love, again, the care that's taken to constructing this as an album. Like this flows beautifully there are several there's many moments on the track list here where songs will just melt into the next song seamlessly and you'll barely even be able to tell that a new song has started it has this continuous vibe that just pulls you through in this very slickly executed way that i absolutely love like the run of songs from uh the zone i mean really from the zone through maybe the whole rest of the record you're just continually it's this, it feels like the single piece of music essentially mm -hmm. that is just running through these different um, choruses and hooks and ideas and instrumental palettes. And Yachty continually, I think, explores different ways that his newfound psych rock aesthetic can be melded with his skills and strengths as a rapper, as a performer, as a hip hop artist, and also the features as well that he's incorporating on here. You do have guest verses on songs like Pretty, for instance. So I, in general, I, I'm really impressed with how well this comes together. What are your thoughts, Jake? I think that you and I are on largely the same page about this album, which is nice and refreshing because I've paid attention to the way this album is being talked about online. And, you know, I'm not trying to go off on too much of a tangent here, but I kind of hate how people talk about this album. Because on one end of the spectrum, you have people that are just talking about it because it is such a pivot and just sort of isolating that idea of it being like, oh, this is new and different. They're just and because there is obvious skillful execution, there's also kind of a, a lack of interrogation of what this album is actually doing beyond adopting just a new sound for Yachty. But also on like the 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 music writer blog sort of tastemaker end of the spectrum there's a lot of cynicism around it because there is just kind of willful admonishment of the idea that like it's been going around that Lil Yachty said that he did this in order to be taken seriously as an artist and that statement has been used as a criticism against him like Yachty is basically saying that he's turning his back on his roots and sort of going against the idea of like specifically black music. And first of all, I think this wholly disingenuously like just completely turns back on the fact that you have people like, you know, Jimi Hendrix and Chuck Berry, who, you know, you know, black artists who pioneered sounds like this in the first place that I think root that in a kind of experience that is a lot more credible than a lot of people would at least first initially lend it credit to. 
But besides that, I see this less as an indictment of Yachty and more an indictment of modern music listeners. It's because it's because Yachty isn't necessarily saying that he like views his music or his past music in one way or the other. It's really more that no one would take me seriously like this. So I wanted to do something else. And after he's already made a career off of building stuff like, you know, the little boat mixtape, Teenage Emotions, whatever you feel about those albums, I still feel like there's not exactly a rejection of that, but a pivot to just be like, well, I've already done this. So why not mm. try to do this instead? He and is the reason doing what I to do which is explore different aesthetics and evolve yeah. and do things and maybe he'll do something completely different maybe he'll abandon this completely but i don't i i agree there's a kind of cynicism behind the idea that yachty is is not doing this because he wants to do it or because mm -hmm. he feels passion in it and to me like i don't know yachty's inner feelings but i know when i listen to this it feels as though there is passion behind it. It feels though there's love behind it. It feels though there's craftsmanship behind it. And it feels though, especially from Yachty, that every step of the way that he is thrilled to be doing this and that he's creatively energized. And I'm not saying that psych rock music is inherently more creatively valuable than trap music. I'm no. just saying that Yachty feels as that what Yachty has done is he has demonstrated a versatility that because it is hard when you are skillful or when you work within a particular framework and a style of art or a style of music and that is what you are practiced in and that is what you have honed it is hard to change that it is hard to do something different it is really hard it feels unnatural it can feel embarrassing you can feel completely out of your depth and so it takes a lot of courage to even attempt to pivot like this in the first place and for me to feel a genuine level of actual craft and satisfaction and power in this music that is not just me giving Yachty credit for trying and you know points for the yeah, A for effort sort of thing but actually mm -hmm. feeling as though he has achieved something substantive here it's it's hard to do that it's really hard to do that and for anyone not just someone coming from the hip-hop world or anything like that it is hard to do that for any artist to completely flip the script on what you are practiced in. And it can, it makes you vulnerable as well. There's nothing, I don't think personally, I don't think there's anything easy or anything sort of like, you know, that Yachty's taken the easy way out by making this kind of music. He's risking ridicule, but by doing this and some people, you know, have, have, have taken it that way. I think generally the buzz and the response you know, more often than not has been pretty positive, which is great to yes. see. Um, but he's taking risks here. You know, he's risking a com completely failing in a way that's going to draw more attention to him, as, you know, than previous quote unquote failures might have. So I think that, you know, if anything, we need to give Yachty credit for the sheer cojones it takes to just fully commit to this. In my opinion, if you're going to, you know, cry cynical at something, cry cynical at music listeners who established this precedent to begin with. It's it's people like, again, lar again, probably largely white audiences as well that would, you know, turn their nose up at stuff like trap music necessarily. Like, I think that if you're going to you know, draw anything negative from that. It's that, again, the, the fact that Yachty feels this way to begin with is not his fault in the slightest at all. And, you know, you can still have a disparity in how you receive, you know, his new music compared to his old music. But I just think that people are reading into everything in like the least generous way they possibly could and it leads to them kind of seeing what he's doing here which honestly is not just straight psych rock i think that this has a lot of the makings of trap music it's particularly a lot of these songs from the get-go honestly they they bleed kind of like a sort of travis scott rodeo era kind of mm -hmm. stuff where with the vocals and how they synthesize with some of the rockier passages and look I am completely on the same wavelength as Riley and that I think that this is just a really solid 
front to back album that at first I just kind of appreciated, but then I just sort of grew to enjoy the vibe of. And I think there's no better validation for the point we're making other than the fact that the collaborators that um, Yachty has enlisted on this album include that of Justin Risen, who, if you know who that is, that is the guy who is helping Eve Toomer, who I think is a very close comparison point for Yachty here. And that I think that Eve Toomer's last album, Heaven to a Tortured Mind, certainly plays a slight sort of influence on this as that is an album that was also kind of a pivot in and of itself, even mm -hmm. though Eve Toomer is obviously a way, like his bit is that, you know, like there's an uh, eclectic nature to their music upon each every album that feels like it's embracing new different kinds of genres and on his last album there was a pivot to just basically be like psych rock prince but there was also elements of hip hop there were elements of electronic music there were elements of all over that kind of stuff and i feel like you know if you're listening to Eve Toomer and using that as your comparison point for the music that you're making, being like anyone seeing this as like phony or disingenuous isn't seeing the forest for the trees here. And I think that the production work all across this album is pretty solid. If I have one overriding complaint, it's that I feel like his trap sensibilities kind of carry over in ways that don't always complement the mood. Uh, the vocals, I think, are consistently great. I love the sort of kind of mired and electronic swampiness that this whole album kind of has. It is languid, but I feel like that just sort of adds to the really nice, hazy vibe that Psych Rock is. I mean, kind of engineered for, but a lot of people, a lot of people who probably weren't, didn't ever have their feet in circles like hip hop, wouldn't be willing to take their vocals into direction wise. Mm -hmm. This does have a lot of similarities to, you know, Tame Impala, very inner speaker. Um, and I like that about it a lot. The production element that I get along with the least is probably the drums. I find them throughout the album to be consistently mixed a little bit too highly, and the rhythmic elements kind of disrupt the, again, the the sort of just hazy vibe on occasion. I just sort of feel like that might be one of the growing pains that's coming from, you know, Yachty, who is traditionally more inclined towards the rhythmic elements of something like hip hop and trap. But that isn't something that like substantially weighs anything down here. I'm, in fact, I don't really have a weak... Like they're, you know, the spoken word bit on the record is obviously not the the high point or anything, and it shows his limits as a lyricist. But at the same time, I like that this album is a little bit metatextual in the sense that this album is very much about Yachty hitting a wall and not really knowing what to do about it emotionally and artistically. He's just kind of channeling the fact that he's taking this left turn pivot in his sound and making that to be like, I don't know what I'm doing, so I might as well do this. And it's a pretty interesting result. I think that it doesn't really get better than the opening two songs. I Look, pastiche as it may be, the Black Seminole is a great song. I love this whole fucking thing. This is like the bubbly kind of synths that start everything off. The, the way that this song has basically three different sections that, no, they aren't particularly cohesive, but it makes me fucking like... I, I this fucking is a like... Complete... my as an opening track, as a, like a complete immersion into this new world, it's a real masterstroke. The um, female vocals on this are like, again, <laughs> like we compared them to Great Gig in the Sky, and I would compare them on a quality level, because when they come in and they're just like, ah, you feel like you're fucking floating. That shit sounds incredible. I love that. And the guitar shit on this, yes, I know, it's very Pink Floyd, and, you know, nobody on here is David Gilmore, but at the same time, it's a great fucking sonic idea that I feel like is used really well late into the track list as well. I think that the the first two songs, The Black Seminole and The Ride, are certainly the, my favorite things on here. But also, We Saw the Sun, uh, Reach the Sunshine, I've Officially Lost Vision. All these songs, especially I've Officially Lost Vision, has a great hook on it. And that's another thing that I think Yachty carries over from his trap sensibilities is his knack for hooks. And they don't feel traditionally like psych rock hooks, which that's not a genre that's particularly known for its hook writing to begin with but this feels very much like it's influenced by like the flaming lips specifically like clouds taste metallic flaming lips mm -hmm. like early on harder edged sort of like scruffy kind of shit and 
while I do think the album is a bit long winded, like maybe it could use some trimming. It is almost an hour long. And this is a sound that I think probably would exist better in the 40 to 45 minute long range. I still enjoy basically everything on here. Like I don't really even the spoken word segment. I just it, it, again, the lyricism here or just the lyricism, just what Yachty is saying here is very like uh, money didn't solve all my problems. And it's like. Yeah, I, I yeah, he, he sure. comes to some he comes to some uh, realizations, which, of course, to us sound a little bit rote. But obviously, mm-hmm. I think in the context of, you know, when you're examining this in terms of how Lil Yachty has made this pivot and, and his artistic process, it does give you a little bit of an insight. So I value it for that yeah. reason. Um, yeah, my favorite thing on here by far is The Ride, which I think is one of the best songs so good. of the year so far. This song is, un- I mean, first of all, it's a great pop song. But it's yeah, like the totally. sounds in this are just crazy. Like the guitar is so like kind of detuned and like just spectral and squealing. And the way it's that he's so kind of, high pitched, like I've never he heard just a sort guitar of sound drifts like this. around it in this really sort of ethereal but still very present way is so good. I listened to it like I'm, we're in a heat wave here at the moment. I listened to it in the car literally a couple of hours ago. It's it made me feel like I was floating, like you said. It is just it's a great fucking song. I'm also really fond of Deep Cut Should I Be, which has an amazing hook. This song's been stuck in my head for the last few days. Really, really love this. I love the way that it kind of, it sort of like transitions perfectly into the Alchemist, the song after it, which just functions essentially as an extended outro for that song. I love the Mm -hmm. moments of the record where Yachty gets so kind of, locked in and absorbed within a certain space that a song has taken him that you get to kind of expand and explore that space with him in a way that feels very true to the links between psych rock and prog rock as well in the 70s as well Mm -hmm. again very true to what you would get from pink floyd but so cannily and well crafted into this current popular aesthetic that i am just completely won over by it uh, I also enjoy, I also really enjoy the song Running Out of Time, which in- interestingly has a production feature from Matthew Lewin of the band Magdalena Bay, who mm-hmm. helped produce this song. Uh, I, the main reason this song stands out to me is that the the guitar sound in it and the chord choices re- are like a, almost exactly the same as Estelle's American Boy. Like it just is, <laughs> and that just completely, like every time I listen to the song, I think of it's not even the vocal melody it's just the guitar chords and the and stuff and the sound of it is just so reminiscent of that song to me which is really cute um i could definitely do without pretty which i think is the moment where it kind of the album again with the the rap feature which i don't really care for um and again it's not that the when yachty integrates more familiar hip-hop elements into the record it doesn't work it's just that this particular song feels a little bit undercooked um, but then once yeah. you get back to the zone and from there on out, it's it's basically just it's hitting yeah. a very consistent um level that I am I find very easy to just let play out and, and get lost in. Um yeah, drive me crazy and say something as well. Beautiful songs too. Uh I, I think the record I, I like a lot of what happens instrumentally, I guess, and the closing track Reach the Sunshine, although it feels like one of the least fully formed things here musically. It kind yeah. of just is a bu- it, there's like it's so much of this album works because all the different ideas that Yachty are kind of cramming together cohere within the structure and format of these songs with the exception of the opener and the closer but then the opener works because it's just just this throwing you into this new soundscape so well and setting up setting up the aesthetics before the songs after it give you a more you know polished format but then reach the sunshine at the end feels a little bit like a like a digression like it doesn't really yeah. end the album as well as i would like it to end but still on the whole i i i'm i'm really been i've really been enjoying this this week i've come back to it each time i've come back to it i've enjoyed it a little bit more and i think that it's something that deserves to be praised and and should earn yachty a level of respect that should come without the condescension of oh well he's he's you know he's adopted you know, popular sort of white guy psych rock tropes. So therefore he's one of the part of the club now. I think we can avoid that and, and just admire it. For... That, that is just as dismissive as the people who outright dismiss like his shallower trap aesthetics as like, I, I find no difference between those things. And it really annoys me. Yeah. So, so that's where we're coming from. It's, uh, it's a winner in our book. Well done to Lil Yachty. Keep pursuing this, you know, this artist. Please. Impulse. And I think yourself... that if you, th- this sets up, I think what could be like, 
I think that there are a lot of people who are generally a little bit more hot. Like the people who like this album generally seem to like love it and it does feel refreshing. But to me, this is a template for something that I feel like he could build on and make something properly masterful with because there are growing pains here. And I think that my most overriding criticism of the album is that it feels more like a vibe than an album, but a good vibe is still a good thing for something to be at the end of the day. And I feel like that comes from a result of the pivot. It's just that he's not as experienced with this sound as he could be. And going forward, that means that I feel like he has a properly great album in him. It, he gets close here with me. I think this is bordering on great, but it just it needs a lot of really small adjustments and a lot of attention paid to it when it comes to its overall construction to I think really get there. But overall, I just it, it it's just refreshing. It's nice. I I like that this exists and if you want a version of this that's, you know, a little bit more I don't know, interesting in terms of how it takes the psych rock influences, but make it into something more quintessentially new and modern, then yeah, go listen to Eve Toomer because that already exists. So. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And look, can I just say it's an obvious joke, so I've got to make it. Let's hope that his next album is finally Lil Yacht Rock because. Oh God. God. <laughs> I mean, he's not a million miles away here. So I want to hear him Heading on some kid Charlemagne shit with the next album. Come oh, on, get Lil fucking um, <laughs> get a. Let's see. I mean, like again, I wouldn't be opposed to uh Justin producing another one again, but it's like this has so many possibilities. Get like fucking Sean Everett in his war on drugs mode to make your next album or something, man. Like really, or, really lean into that. Or legitimately just get Adam Granduccio to do some oh, guitar God. solos and shit. That would Look. be so sick. <laughs> anyway. Let's do our favorite tracks and ratings for Lil Yachty's Let's Start Here. Jake, why don't you go first? Uh, my three favorite tracks got to be the the one-two punch of Black Seminole and The Ride. I think that that's just a, a great one-two punch of music. Really love it. And third favorite track, probably I've officially lost vision. That's that's had a hook that's just kind of been staying in my head. His delivery of a lot of the lines on here is really paired with the vocal effects. Just... Eh, Everything just kind of sticks with me in my head. Really, really solid stuff. Least favorite, probably uh, Drive Me Crazy. It's not a bad moment on the record, but it does kind of interrupt the consistency of the second half. Like the first half of this album to me has its most essential moments, but is overall more inconsistent. And the second half, while it doesn't reach some of the highs of like those first two songs, is overall just kind of a straight heat from the, yeah, after like the zone, basically, it's just like a really straight shot of really great music. I would say that overall, I'd give it a very enthusiastic six and a half out of ten overall okay well my three favorite picks are easily the ride should i be and the black seminole least favorite i mean you know excluding failure is yeah. pretty um and i'm gonna give the album a seven i gave it the bump earlier this morning and i don't regret it it's it's just really stuck with me, and I think that it will go down, you know, if not one of the year's greatest albums, certainly one of the year's most memorable ones, and that, in mm -hmm. many ways, is just as impressive of an achievement. Yeah. So, More artists do this, please. That gives us an average overall of 6.7 for a little Yachty's Let's Start Here. And let's continue here now into oh, Paranul's new album, After the Magic. I mean, boy, what is what else did you say about Paranormal? If you listen to our Now episode uh, earlier this week, you will have known that Jake completely gave you a laundry list of everything you need to know about the last couple of years of uh, Longinus recordings, of fifth wave emo, adjacent shoegaze and dream pop, all these bands from different corners of the world, from Korea, from Brazil, from wherever, uh, coming together or being able to share music through Bandcamp and through online spaces and carving out this exciting new niche that has finally exploded. And in a lot of ways, it feels like all of that, every single release that we've talked about, every single thing we've shouted out, all of it's building to this. You know, in the three-act narrative structure of this whole wave so far, this is the third-act triumph. Like this is the 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 hero's victory, you know. Uh, you know, overcoming after overcoming, you know, with, with all the I guess obstacles being just general obscurity, 
having this moment of just complete recognition as a product of creating something with a vision that is so it's both so clearly defined and absolutely richly realized but also completely pulling together so many different elements so many different aesthetics so many different aspects of indie rock history of shoegaze history of of indie tronica and electronic history of blog rock history of emo history what paranormal has done with after the magic is simply created a masterpiece that not only builds upon all of the strengths and absolutely ecstatic aspects of their last record which still remains my favorite paranormal record one of my favorite albums of all time but and that could never be topped but what this is is better than him him trying to top that which is taking the core elements of it refining those into something that is going to reach more people without losing the spirit and idiosyncrasy that made to see the next part of the dream what it is but also completely widening the pool of influences and widening the pool of instrumentation of aesthetics of all the different things that are feeding into this to see the next part of the dream for as elementally perfect as it was in my opinion is fundamentally very simple it is these you know midi guitars massive you know walls of noise bit crushed and compressed drums and just kind of filtered vocals that scrape and pierce and that's all it is that's all it needs to be that is the source for what it is and after the magic takes those core components refines them into a form that makes them easier to process easier to digest without losing any of the impact and adds a whole new swathe of elements and things into the mix that feel like this artist is barely even beginning to tap into the possibilities of what they can do and has made an unequivocal masterpiece. I, Jake, when we listened to this, when the, the, I remember the night it dropped and you were a couple of songs ahead of me, so it wasn't quite in perfect sync, but that almost added to the experience to me because you were like fucking raving about songs and I hadn't even got there yet. And I was just like, you know, overwhelmed and still processing. It was one of those beautiful little experiences that we get to have every so often communally across, you know, the Pacific Ocean, but still at the same time with, with music. And I'll treasure it forever because it was beautiful. And it was like, you know, it was funny because it's like, even though Paranormal is my guy, you were like mm -hmm. more pumped for this than I was. Like I was pumped for it, but I was like kind of reserving myself. I was like, just I'll listen to it when it's out and I'll let it hit me then. But you were like, you know, you were waiting for the drop and you had the link ready when it was out and you were just like straight away download hit play. Holy shit. What the fuck? I was like, okay, <laughs> I'm on it. Yep. Here we go. Let's go. Let's go. Hit play. Uh. To the till the day I die, I will not forget the experience of hearing Polaris for the first time. I will uh... not every second of my experience listening to this, and I know you had one as well. So we'll get to tell both of our stories. Every second of my experience listening to this is burned into my head. Like, first of all, like when you get that acoustic guitar intro and it's got that mm -hmm. crispness to it, and this kind of also, that it's got that major chord thing, but it's like double tracked and it has this kind of slight level of reverb on it as well that gives it this really sort of dreamy feel. You get like calls, which are like such a far cry from, you know, the, the intensity and the full throatedness of what you were getting on most of his last album. I'm like, whoa, okay, where are we? We're somewhere new here. We're in this pure dream pop space. And I'm like, fuck, okay, this is awesome. And I had already heard We Shine at Night. We'll get to that. I'd already heard that as a single, but I only, I pointedly only listened to it a couple of times because I didn't want to wear it out for the album. Mm -hmm. but Polaris, man, you get that. You're in that. You're just bathing. Mm. And it's just this gorgeous thing. You automatically instantly feel like, okay, I'm in a new place now. I'm with this person. I completely trust them. And then you get the moment. You get, you get the moment mm. where this song just completely stops and explodes. And it's like a fucking supernova it is like a complete explosion of sound it's the kind of musical experience you get to discover naturally purely maybe once every few years just this moment that this song gives you where all of a sudden this entirely new spectrum of possibilities for this artist 
completely unfurls in front of you and you realize that you're really in the presence of something special. Jake, that experience, tell me about that, what that was like for you. It was discovering that Paranul has been hiding his power level. I don't know what it was, but like I was really trying to immerse myself in the Longinus Records things because obviously this is one of our collectively most anticipated albums of the year. So naturally, and it's like the first truly like big potential, like, oh, this could be like an album of the year candidate. So I was definitely prepared. And even though I listened to see the next part of the dream and was just like, yeah, I, I definitely feel like I I love this album, but I still feel like this can be taken further or just like it'll play to my sensibilities even more and i don't know what it was but i just i as soon as i got the album from Bandcamp, i put it on my phone and i was driving to work and i was just like this is the moment i gotta do it i gotta put it on my car stereo and it was weird because that first half it has that little like i mean it's there's influences of like indie rock and emo throughout this whole thing but at the very beginning it's got that the little just like acoustic And you're just kind of like, well, this is certainly different. And I'm just like, wow, is the whole album going to be like this fucking like strange? And then you get that moment, which is like, it was like listening. It's like listening to like velocity design comfort where you're hearing something that doesn't feel like it it, it it could physically exist. You feel like you've never heard this sound before. It's this entirely sweeping, slate-clearing, universe-destroying, colorful synth that just comes in and sounds like it is ripping the entire planet apart and just makes the way for this huge crescendo, this huge build. And then... It's just the second half of Polaris. This is the best moment in music so far for the year. And again, the rest of the album's not far behind, but it just, it sets up such an immaculate expectation. It's just, everything feels like it's locked into place. For Paranol, it feels like this is a moment for him specifically to be like, okay, I've proved my mettle with my previous projects. I've done coll collaborations with some of my label mates, and now this is ready to be received by people, you know, and now we're getting, you know, Pitchfork making them best new music. It feels like he knew what was at stake. The, the pitch was lined up and he called his shot. And this album is Babe Ruth hitting the home run throughout the entirety of it. Polaris is far from the only structurally dynamic song on here. In fact, I would go as to say every song on here is structurally incredibly fucking ambitious, incredibly weird, goes in directions that you would never predict that they go mm -hmm. off on tangentially in terms of playing into the emo and in the rock inclinations of paranormal sound that have certainly been there since the start but feel way more played into i mean for fuck's sake you have songs on here like sketchbook which i was just like this sounds this sounds this like, like Susumu indie, Hirasawa. This got so much indie tronica in it it's like so much electronic elements of 2000s indie music in this and then all the sweet give... trip is all over oh, yeah, this sweet, fucking thing sweet trip is like the most you know is the most rate your music core indie tronica act so that makes so much sense but like yeah it, it, the the level of creativity and the level of like pulling together different worlds and arenas of indie music into this ultimate kind of love letter to all of paranormal's creative influences is so awe-inspiring in a lot of ways, this album feels like it's it's the record I think that he has wanted to make, but has needed a certain level of success to be able to afford the the label backing and the support to be able to produce this. Because you can tell instantly that whereas to see the next part of the dream was I think entirely MIDI instrumentation. I think I'm not sure if everything was completely synthesized, um, because you know it was made on note with no budget. Uh, whereas this, you can very much tell that there's real instrumentation happening here. The line is blurred because that's part of Paranormal's aesthetic, but there's exactly. just a lot more weight and dynamic range in this record. And obviously a lot more money put into making it sound the way that it does. It's obviously been professionally mastered. And it is, it's so, it's just sensational. Like, and I want to as well start by reading the short statement that Paranol put on the Bandcamp page for this album, because I believe his own words are the most fitting place for interrogating what this is as mm -hmm. a step forward. And he says, 
Um, I'm always afraid when what I have now will disappear and when people will leave me, I think these are some kind of magic that will shine bright for a while and then lights out like nothing happened. So he feels this sense of, you know, um, impermanence to the moment that he's living in, the idea that this level of success that he has could disappear at any point in time. So everything he does needs to feel worth it. And so that he says, this is an album that I made with dreams. Um, and, and, and also thank makes a point of thanking people all over the world for the assistance on it as well. And so, yeah, it feels like a product, something that he has wanted to make that he has built towards and brings together so much innovation within even within the aesthetic of the the records that this is pulling from and the aesthetic and and the scene that this album and this band sits within it's so it's so it feels so new despite also being so recognizably paranormal um polaris as well like me being the fan i am of jimmy Eat world it was impossible for me not to mm. immediately draw a parallel between this song and this Jimmy Eat World song, Polaris, off of the album Futures, which I'm willing to bet hard, hard, hard cold cash, if we could ask Paranor what his favorite Jimmy Eat World album is, he would say Futures. This album's got so much Futures all over it. Oh, it's God, yeah. And the walls of guitar on that record are just so recognizable here. Funnily enough, this opening track, it reminds me not so much of the song Polaris off of that album, but of the song Night Drive, which has a similar kind of like... Mm -hmm. Ooh, same sort of vocal thing and this wall of sound that it builds through as well um, but also you know part of the reason why i put out my m83 out my m83 discography ranking this week and also part of the reason why i realized why a particular album in that discography ranking deserved to be where it was is that this album is pulling so strongly from mid 2000s m83 specifically before the dawn heals us that few that era where that particular project and you know other projects like it we're starting to fuse this heavily synthetic electronic noise music stuff with the raw power of shoegaze guitars and the urgency of pop, pop music at its core and just bringing all those things together and that feels so much like what paranormal is doing here um i mean it's worth talking about the lead single as well we shine at night which i feel mm. like if you want an end to this record as a fan of the previous Paranormal album, this feels like the closest thing to that record while yeah. still being its own thing. Like, you know, the, the climax of this song where he's literally just screaming. And it, it's just so fucking suffocated sounding, but it also sounds like it's clipping. It's yeah. such a really interesting sonic idea that yeah, he just it, plays with a different kind of every single song on here has an idea just like that where it feels wholly unique but never diverges too much to make you feel like he's just throwing everything with the kitchen sink there is a mm. consistency but also a dynamism to this album that makes it feel like one of the most solidly built shoegaze albums of the last mm. 10 years yeah like and there's a direct line from the the ear scraping screaming on age of fluctuation from the last album to that moment at the end of this song where he's doing a very similar thing but pulling it into this new space and of course contextualizing it with different with a very different song and that's just mm -hmm. really awesome to see as well there are moments on this record like particularly within the first half you have these longer tracks like arrival and parade for instance where he's mm -hmm. cycling through different ideas um to and i think they all work brilliantly uh, my favorite of them is arrival which has just oh. when the song comes in the drums are so heavy but also the the rhythm that they're playing is so kind of off kilter and unusual that it really kind of wakes you up and mm -hmm. the, the way this song kind of starts just kind of deconstructs throughout its runtime and becomes something completely different in a similar way to parade actually which has this beautiful kind of like loud quiet loud structure like the one of my favorite moments on the whole album is just that really just that deep that quiet moment in the middle of parade where he's just kind of whispering mm -hmm. as the guitar this the acoustic guitars are kind of being tracked behind him and it's just it's just devastating it's just so gorgeous and beautiful and and it's made so much more powerful by what it is surrounded by um you have of course the song insomnia which originally featured on the downfall of the neon youth uh split album that came out at the end of 2021 god it's so sounds as good as good in fact, it sounds slightly better it's been slightly remixed um and edited a bit to fit into the flow of this album a bit more and the pianos are just fucking radiant mm. They sound like pure beams of light. 
And Pierre, uh, Paranul's voice as well, his singing voice, has never sounded better than it does here as well, too. He's mm-hmm. able, like, he's not someone who's naturally very tuneful, and he leans into the strengths that he has as a power performer, but he does find moments, like, on this song, where you gen- he can just genuinely be beautiful, have this beautiful cadence to the way that he sings. Um, and comes through in other songs as well, like Imagination, too. And, look, I've got to talk about my favorite song on the album, um, a song that when I listened to it for the first time, it, I just involuntarily wept because the entire thing is gorgeous. But the last two minutes of this particular song is so beautiful that I. You got to be talking about sound inside me, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I am. I am. Okay. The, 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 when I. Ta- I've. I've listened to this song so much this week. Uh huh. The, the the place the song goes to in its last couple of minutes is just un it's out of this world. It is interstellar. It is intergalactically beautiful. It is something that and I'm surprised you didn't just end the album here because it's just such a, a moment of sheer cathartic beauty, like the full summation of all the beauty that this artist can muster. And I'm glad the album doesn't end there because Blossom is an entirely new Aww. sort of, you know, it's an entirely new thing. Yeah. And the title track is just this very beautiful and plaintive thing in its own right. But I mean, yeah, I'm I'm, I'm stealing all the gas here, Jake. I mean, you yeah. tell me about, about your favorite moments in this record and, and what's really hit you uh, over and over again listening to this. I got to talk about what I think is easily the most underrated song on here. It's got the lowest uh, track rating. I think it's the only non-bolded track on the album, and it's easily one of my favorites, which is Sketchbook. Uh, because when it came on, I was just like, this sounds like Susumu Hirasawa. Like, this sounds like a fuzzy shoegaze song that would be on Technique Relief of Relief or Philosopher's Propeller. And, like, the industrial drums on here, the vocal runs on here are fucking delicious it's one of the most like colorful sounding songs but also one of the most rawly noisy and i think that might be what maybe makes people gravitate towards it the least but man the the weird kind of melodic contours he has make for such a weirdly unexpectedly awesome hook to this like i you know obviously i don't speak the same language as him so i can't really repeat the hook but it gets stuck in my head so fucking easily and you know that's actually something that i didn't expect to wow me as much as it did even though i think to see the next part of the dream has some really stirring lyrical content throughout it and it's also it's one that very much revels in it's a very dark record, you know, despite the, uh, you know, the the sky blue kind of album cover and the, the crescendos of emotion that it builds to is that a lot of it talks about being isolated, being depressed, growing up and being a, a shut in. I believe he directly references the fact that he considers himself uh, a Japanese term, uh, which is hikikomori, which is basically someone who I mean, they're basically like functionally a shut in who does not leave their room and spends all of their time on the Internet and on their computer. And like that was something that he really really struggled with and this album really feels like such a beautiful progression from that because all of the lyrical content on here is so bright and liberating all of it talks about him getting out and experiencing life and like just getting to move forward and embracing the you know it's like what we talked about how he's got that fear of impermanence he talked about in interviews for to see the next part of the dream about how he was ready to be dismissed entirely because he did like you know he did make all these albums out of midi instruments and he felt a kind of uh like a, a delegitimizing sort of push that like, you know, he was afraid that people wouldn't take him seriously because his music was fully made on his computer. And he's aware of the fact that that has a certain stigma with it. And here he's able to push beyond those boundaries and embrace, you know, the higher budget, the the bigger sound and the more dynamic sound and make this an overall more rewarding experience for me anyway. But also the the emotional push forward really makes for a kind of lyrical and sonic synergy on 
here where that there was a certain synergy with the production style on to see the next part of the dream and the kind of feeling stuck. And I think that that's what made that album special. And it's what subsequently makes this album feel so special is that it does feel like, again, it's not necessarily like growth or improvement, but it is being able to to press forward and to move on. And it really feels like he is in a better place as an artist and as a person. There are, you know, moments of darkness that are touched upon on this album, but it's all in the sense of the the rear view mirror. This is all about embracing the 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 in the moment parts of of life that you can only truly appreciate when you're dedicated to just like the experience of being alive and how euphoric that feels. And the way he describes, you know, going out at night and, you know, seeing city lights and just being with people or like the sampled sounds of of fireworks and being able to enjoy this sort of communal spectacle. It just it makes me feel really glad for him and it makes me feel really glad because I feel that in the music that's something that the music itself on stuff like Polaris on stuff like Arrival or We Shine at Night or Parade where it just there is this feeling that music itself is integral to the idea of being able to push past that it is the soundtrack to being able to grow as a person and the way he's able to channel that but without you know being imbued with a sense of monotony or being too indebted to his influences, which I don't know how it's possible that he's able to have so many of them while still sounding so quintessentially him. We listen mm. to a shitload of shoegaze. There is nothing out there that sounds quite like this, aside from his typical yeah. strengths of just writing great melodies and stuff. There's just nothing out there that I can give a one to one comparison for this to. Well, everything that Paranol draws from is so dramatically recontextualized in the music that he makes that it can't really sound too much like it. You know what I no. mean? You, you can pick up on those things, but they sound they they've got such a new place here. I'm glad you mentioned Sketchbook as well, because to me that is one of the most innovative and like just musically impressive songs on the record. It takes a lot of Absolutely. risks in terms of being something that could very easily just sound a little bit like an unstructured mess but like the the way in which it gets it kind of glitches out i love the the glitchier moments in this song and then you yeah. get the, bong, the bongos coming in mm -hmm. in the second half and it's such a like it's a, such a tasteful and colorful flavor when contrasted with the glitch as well like this is someone who is working with musical ideas and ideas of structure and of you know the layering and, and inclusion of various different um instruments with each other and he's approaching it in a very innovative and very thoughtful way that gives you a lot of really, really new combinations and experiences that feel like they work and that feel like they're synergistic. And that's one element of Paranormal that I think is maybe slightly underestimated is that as great as he is at creating these, you know, massive walls of sound and these fantastic little melodies that anchor them, he's also just really great compositionally at yeah. figuring out ways to incorporate new forms of instrumentation or to position and place different instruments and different tracks, I guess, alongside each other in ways that create a new unusual effect. And this album's full of moments like that. I think sketchbook mm -hmm. is, is the centerpiece for that reason, but arrival has that too. Uh, yeah. Blossom is another great song that does that as well. Uh, I'm particularly fond of the song imagination as well, which mm -hmm. feels like, you know, at that point of the record where it hits, you've had these like four really long songs that go through all these different kind of phases. And then when imagination hits, it's like this kind of bolt of just pure honed to perfection, just sort of pop song craft. That indie rock guitar that gets this song started. I mean, it was, it was so like, my jaw like hit the fucking floor. I was just like, holy fucking shit. This sounds like something I would hear on like a, you know, something that would get best new music from 2005 <laughs> in Pitchfork. Like what yeah. the hell, man? Yeah, it's and it's just, Asian Glow, I think, is on the guitar on that song, isn't yes. he? Yeah, he yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely is. And it's it's awesome. It's just such an awesome moment to get this pure piece of indie rock perfection being delivered, like after this long, you know, stretch of him being in the woods and being in this kind of like, you know, not wild ceiling mode, not white ceiling mode, because that song's just very much in the same mode for 10 minutes. But, you know, those longer songs on that record that mm -hmm. do sort of meander through different kind of phases. Um, and I haven't even mentioned as well, my favorite song, Sound Inside Me, Waves Inside You, also features uh, Delazier as well, yes. um, joining in on the vocals too. And it's just like, again, I think it's something about just the energy of the song, the sense of comfort and warmth that comes through the presence of two people, but also through just the vibe of that final stretch of it as well. It just feels mm -hmm. so 
warm and full of love and and the strings on the first half Mm. oh the strings on this whole fucking album yeah fuck me man Uh, absolutely a cut above it's a triumph it's a it's another beautiful success for paranormal it's another absolutely deserved and earned um master class in songwriting and musical construction and in taking a bold step forward for an artist that and this is not going to be a comparison that sits very well with you um and that's fine but i'm just going to say it because it feels appropriate in terms of like you know online bands that are very very popular but mm. um the com- the comparison i thought in terms thought of in terms of the difference between this and the previous album is black country new road where it was like when no, I, I, I think remember, that's yeah i remember when we reviewed there for the first time i was like this feels like such a perfectly honed distillation of this band's identity that i can't imagine how they could improve it they would have to just kind of completely explode into all sorts of different directions and that's exactly what they that's did that's what they did and it ended up being something that i thought was uh, more impressive as a result of that despite originally thinking that for the first time was like you know this tightly wound honed thing that couldn't be improved upon and that's kind of like what paranormal has done here is that with the previous record it's very one note it's a note that i think is the might be the greatest note ever played in my opinion <laughs> but it's the kind of thing that you know you listen to it and no matter where you fall down on it you're like i want to see this artist just completely explode into different directions with what they're doing here and that's absolutely what the what paranormal does with after the magic it is everything you want from a follow-up to a breakout record it completely ups the ante yes. and makes you feel as though the sky is the limit for this amazing amazing figure that i feel truly privileged to have been able to follow and make this commentary on with each release that they have put out it feels as though it's a fundamental part of the narrative of our channel in a strange way well, it feels like that journey that you talked about how it's like the third act climax it's like the you know it starts with to see the next part of the dream and this is this is the end of the movie where you know you you get to the top of the hill and you you've done it you've made it through all the strife and you've arrived there and i feel like that one of the best things about this album is that it still doesn't feel like a creative endpoint. It's just, it's not even like, oh, it's it's so ambitious. It's doing all these different things. It's like, yeah, but it's also doing them in a way where it's like, I could see this, you know, level of creativity sustaining him for three, four, five more albums of just being able to explore the the sheer amount of diversity of influences here. And it would never wear thin. The, I, the Like you said, I mean, the sky is the limit, honestly. Mm-hmm. And it just ends so beautifully with the title track as well. It's mm-hmm. just such a, a beautiful return... denouement. It's a return to earth moment as well. It's one of the most kind of like just low key, yeah, low stakes sort of things where it, it does feel very much like that kind of end credits moment where you're just kind of absorbing the full totality of everything that's come before it. And you get these yeah. sort of, you know, you get the typical kind of swells and dense sort of wall of sound builds, but you get those beautiful little, I think they're kind of like glockenspiely sort of like twinkling mm-hmm. melodies. And these li- lovely little modulating synthesizer tones that I absolutely love. And Paranormal's voice kind of guiding you through to just this perfect ending moment at the very end where it just ends. And it's, mm-hmm. and it's, and, you know, and everything is in its right place as it was when it began. So, yeah. Bravo. Take a bow. <laughs> God. What, a, what an absolute triumph. Okay, well, favorite tracks and ratings for After the Magic, then. I'll go with, I'll give Morgan's first, since Morgan wanted yeah. to be here, but couldn't stick around and is a huge fan of this album as well. Morgan loves this record. Uh, his favorite tracks are Insomnia, Sound Inside Me, Waves Inside You, and Polaris. Least favorite is Sketchbook, and Morgan gives it a 9 out of 10. Uh, as for me, mm. my three favorite tracks are Polaris, We Shine at Night, and of course, Sound Inside Me, Waves Inside You. Least favorite track, you know, I, I really, I genuinely, it's not even just a cop out. I don't have one anymore. Like before it was mm. after the magic, but now I've just come to be so fond of how that ends the record. And it's really yeah. grown on me. I am completely at the point where I am fully on board. This album gets a nine from me. Kind of similar with me is that I, is that after the magic, it, it, it feels like it's really more of like the, the title track, I mean, is more of a structural, you know, addition to the album than a moment in and of itself. 
And that's why it was my least favorite. But again, as that sort of denouement purpose, I, I wouldn't have it any other way. So I don't really have a least favorite track either. And three favorites. I mean, fuck me. I legitimately think the first six songs on this album are perfect. Like I, I would lay all of them are great. And this, the, the, it doesn't really sink much lower than that either. Uh, but I would say my three favorites, Polaris. I won't say Insomnia just because that exists on another project and i feel like that was one of my favorite songs on that one as well so i'll i'll divert a bit from that and say sketchbook and sound inside me waves inside you uh yeah no least favorite track really and i give it a, a, a 9.5 this is this is the one to beat this year for me and i have a feeling it will not happen anytime soon uh could go up I don't know, man. We'll Who see. Uh, it's it's beautiful. Which means the best part of these albums is you get a, you, you get to live with them, and I'm excited to do that. And August as well, who couldn't join us, has been really enjoying this record as well. I'll pass along. He currently has it at a seven on Rate New Music, which might as well be a ten from him. So yeah, <laughs> across, across the board, uh, really loving this. Blowing endorsements. Um, and so uh, between the four of us, an average rating of eight point six for Paranols. Mm after the magic mm. let us know what you think of either of the albums we've discussed today little yachty's let's start here and paranormals after the magic in the comments below were you as taken with them as we were were you even more taken with them if that is even possible in the case of paranormal what are your thoughts what experiences did you have did these albums take some time to grow on you or have they not quite hit or grown for you yet let us know whatever your feelings are in the comments below uh, we love reading your comments and we're very excited to be back doing new release reviews again so we can be on the pulse of the most exciting new stuff if you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a like and subscribing to the channel if you have not already. If you're listening over on Spotify or Apple, you can head on over to the link in the description and you can visit our YouTube that way. Support us however you would like. If you want to go above and beyond, you can hit the join button on our YouTube page and for just $1 a month, you can become a member of the Jams and Tea family and you can get your name in the title crawl of every video on this channel. Plus, if you want to recommend us some music to listen to, your recommendation will go to the top of the pile. As always though, folks, until next time, rock over London. Rock on Chicago, Samsung, do what you can.